Hi, and welcome to video 11 on the central part of Plato's dialogue, the Euthyphro. Uh, and this is going to cover what has come to be known as the Euthyphro question. Um, and this is really the, the heart of the dialogue, the meat of it, the exciting part. So um, in the lead up to this, I had two questions for you in the discussion forum. Um, <clears throat> and these are just, you know, reading comprehension questions. So how does Euthyphro uh, try to define holiness in 7a? And then what question does Socrates ask in 10a? And how does it undermine what's going on in 7a? So, um, and that's because that's fundamentally that back and forth there is the structure for this part of the dialogue. Um, so the answer is pretty straightforward, right? Um, uh, in 7a, um, Euthyphro says that holiness is what the gods love. And I should say that I'm switching back and forth between saying holiness and piety here because I have taught this using different translations and um, uh, therefore I have different slide, PowerPoint slides that I made at different times and some of them use piety and some of them use holiness. Um, but the translation that I assigned use is piety. Right, so let's go ahead and do that. That's what it says right here. Euthyphro, well, what is beloved by the gods is pious and what is not beloved by them is impious. So this is, this is the real turning point. This is where the real fun starts, right? So Socrates has asked Euthyphro, what is piety? And initially Euthyphro just gave examples. Piety is what I'm doing. Um, and Socrates is like, that's not even... Uh, the kind of definition I want, because, you know, obviously a definition would have to encompass other things like praying and offering sacrifices. Well, now Euthyphro has come out and said, um, hey, uh, what is, uh, something is pious if it's loved by the gods. Um, and now Socrates says, with this you have answered in the way I was looking for you to answer. So basically he's saying, yeah, we're doing real philosophy now. This is the, this is the fun part. <clears throat> and for the most part here, though, Socrates is, is really driving the conversation. And Euthyphro is just kind of smiling and nodding. Yes, Socrates. And this is a, a problem that has been sort of acknowledged by Plato scholars for a long time. There are long stretches of these dialogues where it's not really a dialogue. It's just Socrates speaking and someone else saying, yes, Socrates. And you kind of wonder why bother having it be a dialogue. But um, I think we can drill down and see some uh, understanding of how uh, the, the role of the interaction between the characters here. But basically what's happen what happens now is Euthyphro has proposed a definition right? What is loved by the gods is pious, and what is not loved by them is impious. Um, and Socrates is going to start raising objections. But Euthyphro isn't really smart enough to keep up with Socrates, so Socrates winds up coming up with his own replies to those objections. And so that's what happens with the first objection, which isn't one that I was asking you about on, on the discussion forum. But actually, the very first thing that comes up is Socrates wonders, well, what if the gods disagree, right? Um, and anyone who's spent time reading uh, Greek mythology knows that the gods fight a lot. And in fact, our arguments, uh, wars between humans are often just reflections of wars going on between the gods. And this is actually a really interesting passage, and I'm going to pause here to talk about uh, some imp some implications that are in the background. So Socrates says, well, what if the gods disagree? Um, and Euthyphro just says, yeah, well, I guess that, that's, that's an issue. Um, and then Socrates mentions, you know, in, for some things, when people disagree, we have ways of resolving the issue. If we want, if we disagree about how many things are in, uh, there are, like how many sheep are in a flock, we can count right? If we disagree about how much things weigh, we can use a scale. If we disagree about how big something is, we can use a ruler. Um, this may seem like an odd tangent, but it is 
alluding to an issue that's actually really important to Plato, which is um, the difference between important philosophical ideas like piety, typically ethical ideas, and more concrete physical things that can be resolved by artisans and craftsmen, right? Um, so one thing that's going on with holiness seems to be that it's not the kind of thing that you can solve disagreement about using measurement, right? Uh, Euthyphro's response here is actually pretty, when he does manage to come up with something, his own contribution, it's pretty lame. He mostly just says, well, but everyone will agree that what I'm doing is right. Uh, so what, ha what has happened again is that he has come back around to himself, right? Um, and and uh, what, wants to just constantly be asserting that what he is doing is morally correct. Socrates then has this thing, well, um, you yeah, know, maybe they, about how, he has a long discussion about how gods may disagree and different things they may disagree about when it comes to evildoing, right? Maybe they'll disagree about whether someone is an evildoer, that sort of thing, and, and, and he compares it to court practice. But then in the end, he just raises, he just, um, comes up with a response to his own objection. Um, he says, well, maybe we can just say that if, if all the gods love it, it's holy. And then if all the gods hate it, it's unholy. And what they disagree on is both or neither or something, right? So that's what this is here. Hmm. If you want, let us allow that all, God, that all gods think this is unjust and that all of them despise it. But, the, uh, but this current correction to the definition that what all gods despise is impious while what they all love is pious and what some love and some hate is neither or both, do you want to now define the pious and impious in this way? Um, that's, that's awkwardly worded um, and that's a kind of a reflection of the way Socrates talks. The um, translator here is trying to bring Socrates' speech prop uh, accurately into English. The point is um, that Socrates has now proposed uh, a slight amendment, a slight change to the definition, which deals with the objection that Socrates himself raised. Um, and so at this point, we are, um, uh, we have solved the kind of reflective equilibrium part of what we're doing. Um, in that we now have a circle, a second definition that captures everything that Socrates wants it, uh, that, that both Euthyphro and Socrates want it to capture, right? Um, nevertheless, there's still a problem. And so this is the problem that it comes up in 7a that I was asking about, right? Um, is the pi, and so this is the question right here. Is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious, or is it pious because it is loved? So that's the question. Do the gods love things because they are holy, or are they holy because the gods love them? This is the thing that's come to be known as the Euthyphro question. The, um, so the dialogue on a whole is centered around the question, what is holiness? But when you hear people talk about the Euthyphro question, if you do other philosophy, you'll hear it. Um, you will see they're actually talking about a, a, a second question that comes up in um, the middle of the dialogue. Um, and this is a dialogue that's just known for the questions it asks and not so much for the answers it gives. So the Euthyphro question originally is, do the gods love things because they are holy or are they holy because the gods love them? <sighs> well, take a second and think about what that means, right? So you can imagine that some things, uh, when you when you just you like ordinary perception, um, uh, this here, this is a Lego piece. It's brown. Um, I perceive that it is brown because it really is brown, right? 
Um, so that is uh, one way, one relationship that the gods might have to holiness. They may see things as holy because they are holy. On the other hand, the gods may make them holy by deciding to love them. Um, and so when I pick something up, this is, uh, you know, this is Socrates' example, a carried thing. I am now holding the Lego piece. Um, it, is a, it is a carried thing because I am carrying it. I didn't look at it and say, oh, over there's a carried thing. I better pick it up, right? So being a brown Lego piece and being a carried Lego piece are two separate things. All right, so how does holiness work? This has become a big question in European philosophy ever since. And it's worth noting that it, it goes across contexts, right? So the Greeks were polytheists. They worshipped many gods. Um, and polytheism is now fairly out of fashion in Europe. Um, you know, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are now the dominant religions in these regions, and they are all monotheist. But the monotheists can um, ask the same question. Does God, singular, love things because they are pious, or are they pious because God, singular, loves them? We can even raise the question in just a, in like a humanist, not even a religious context. So um, we think about it, I think about this in existential terms. The existentialists commonly asserted the existentialists were a school of philosophy dominant in the mid 20th century, um, but actually have roots much farther back in the 19th century. And um, but they commonly said that value exists because people value them. So there's the question, what is the meaning of life? If you say the meaning of life is what you make it, if you think you make the meaning of life, you're giving an existential um, answer to that question. But you can ask, right? Um, do humans value things in the world because they are valuable? Or are they valuable because humans value them? So are you actually making value in the world or are you recognizing it? It's the same question coming up again and again in different contexts. Is value like um, uh, something that you can perceive, like the color brown, or is it something that you decide, like deciding to pick something up? All right. One possible answer to this it goes by the name divine command theory. Um, and I'm going to stick with this in the religious context because this is mostly where it comes up. Actions are good if and only if God commands them. So this is essentially a version of uh, an answer to the Euthyphro question. It says things become good because God loves them. Things become good because God commands them. This is one way of answering the Euthyphro question should note that not everyone who believes in God will answer the Euthyphro question this way, right? Um, uh, so the alternative would be to say that right and wrong exist independently of God, and God in his wisdom and goodness only commands us to things, only commands uh, us to do things that are actually good. Um, to give you a sense of what the other side thinks, here's a, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not hitting that one yet. First, divine command theory. If you uh, accept divine command theory, then actually the issue of solving moral problems becomes a bit more uh, narrow, a bit more s simple. Would you, the way to f figure out what is moral is to d determine what is God's will. Because whatever God wills um, is, but is good because God willed it, because God commanded it. And there are all sorts of things you could look at here. You can look at direct revelation, sacred texts, church authority, even ordinary reasoning. But not everyone thinks that God creates 
value in the world by commanding things. Um, and so here is a quote from uh, the philosopher and theologian and mathematician G.W.F. Leibniz. He says, so in saying that things are not good by any rule of goodness, but by sheerly the will of God, it seems to me that one destroys, without realizing it, all the love of God and his glory. For why praise him and what he has done if he would be equally praiseworthy in uh, doing the exact contrary? So remember, if you embrace divine command theory, you're saying things are good because things are, are good because God commands them. And, you know, God could command one thing one day and another thing another, and it would always be good. The thing itself would just flip back and forth based on whatever God commands. Uh, and this is this 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 is actually a real problem. Sometimes I call this the odd God problem. What if God commanded torture? Right? Would torture then become good? Well, now think about this. Actually, if you read um, what Christians refer to as the Old Testament, um, and you know what Jews just refer to as the Bible, you see that God actually gives a lot of commands that are pretty harsh. In fact, there are many times um, in the Bible when God commands genocide. And so these are just a few that I that come up on Google. The first two are, are Moses uh, uh, committing genocide against the Canaanites. You could read those passages um, as not actually commanding full-blown genocide because he just says destroy the city. But Joshua uh, 6.17 and 1 Samuel both unambiguously have God commanding genocide. So this is Joshua. Um, and this is again against the, the Canaanites. Uh, the city and all that is uh, in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who were with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. Um, and then a little bit later on, the, the devoted, they devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. This is full-blown genocide, right? Um, and uh, to be clear, standard operating procedure in uh, the ancient Middle East was the same as it was in uh, ancient Greece. Uh, if you conquered a city, the standard procedure would be to kill all the men, sell the women and children into slavery. A lot of these moments in the Bible uh, would have been harsh to their audience because um, God is commanding not just the, the uh, killing of all the men, but also the women and children, and also the cattle, which, you know, you could use. Um, something similar happens in uh, 1 Samuel. This time it is against the Amalekites. Now go and attack the Amalekites and destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Uh, put to death uh, men and women, children and infants, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Um, and again, um, actually in this case, uh, Saul's army spares uh, the leader um, and the cattle. Um, you can see where his priorities are. And he... Um, um, uh, destroys things that they think are weak, right, and, and despicable. And you can see actually a, a, a resonance of this with contemporary genocidal movements, um, uh, disgust and contempt for weak. The weak is just a common attitude amongst people who commit genocide, like, you know, the Nazis. Um, and the Lord then regrets that he made Saul king because Saul doesn't know how to follow instructions. So let's get back to divine command theory. 
Christian divine command theorists and Jewish divine command theorists now have to grapple with the fact that God has commanded genocide. And you see different people responding differently to this. Some people say, for instance, well, it was in fact okay uh, when God commanded it, but it's no longer okay and God will no longer command it. Um, you also sometimes see people say, and if God commands it tomorrow, I'll go into the city and kill the infants, which I don't like. I find those people upsetting. Um, I mean, I don't like to go uh, harsh on other people's religion, but if divine command theory plus your reading of the Bible leads you to that, something's gone wrong. Um, one easy way out of this is to say that things uh, are good or bad independently of God, and God in his beneficence and wisdom only commands things are good that are good. Um, and you can still wonder why God, you still have to deal with these passages, but at least you don't have to worry anymore that God is going to command you to do them, and because God did that, it would be the right thing to do. Um, the problem with the other side of the answer to the Euthyphro question uh, thing God commands things because they are good um, is that it seems to now set up goodness as a separate God in itself. And this is actually the kind of answer that Plato is very much concerned with. And he may have been alluding to when, he's talk, when he talks about, uh, again, finding things out by measuring. Um, that is, if there's an independent standard then you're not worried about the judge anymore. You're not worried about God. Um, you just actually want to know the, the thing itself, goodness itself. So that's the heart of this dialogue, right? Um, Euthyphro has proposed a definition that sounds really smart. Um, things are good. Uh, things are, I'm sorry, pious things. Piety is what is loved by the gods. Um, Socrates comes back and says, "Does the god do, do the gods love things because they are pious, or are they pious because the gods love them?" And this has now spawned a whole branch of philosophy and theology that continues to this day. But this is not actually how it winds up being. Um, how it winds up playing out in the dialogue. Instead, we get this strange passage um, between 10a and 11b, which may have, uh, well, the odds are when you were reading it, you were like, I don't know what the hell's going on here. And you skimmed over it and you, you skipped the next part. Um, and I, that's actually okay because there's some kind of logic trap that Socrates sets for Euthyphro here. And honestly, uh, people disagree on the exact reading of it. Um, somehow Socrates gets Euthyphro to contradict himself. And this is a common move in these dialogues. Um, the people Socrates uh, talks to are shown to be not very philosophical because they get caught in contradictions. The contradiction here is somehow based on the fact that uh, Euthyphro winds up endorsing both possible answers to the Euthyphro question. He both says that things are holy because God loves them and God loves them because they are holy. And you can't do that. Oh, this is a weird moment. And I, I'm just, is this even fair? Uh, I mean, Euthyphro has uh, just been introduced to a, really hard philosophical question. Um, Socrates runs verbal circles around him, and we're, I don't even know what we're supposed to conclude from this. I certainly don't know what to think about the um, Euthyphro problem in its polytheist, uh, monotheist, or humanist forms. So, I don't know, this is, a, this is kind of a puzzling moment. Okay, so that kind of wraps up this middle section, right? The first section was the, uh, what, it was the introduction and this definition, the first definition that Euthyphro offers, piety is what I'm doing, prosecuting wrongdoers. 
The first definition isn't even the right kind of answer because it's just an example. The second definition is the right kind of answer. Um, so, uh, piety is what is loved by the gods, but this all gets side uh, side sidetracked by the Euthyphro question, and we wind up dropping it. And so, in the section you're going to read next, um, they kind of play around with a number of different definitions. I'm just going to label this one uh, as the third definition: piety is attending to the gods, sort serving the gods. Um, uh, there are a number of other ideas that get kicked around here. It's not a very stable point of conversation. But um, I'll let you guys read that next and see what you think.